Hey everyone, you're very welcome back to the OPEX Fitness Podcast, where fitness is explained. I'm your host once again, Robbie Burke, and I'm joined on today's show by Chad Wesley-Smith from Juggernaut Training Systems. On this episode, Chad and I take a deep dive into the scientific principles of strength training, where we discuss the seven principles that were outlined in the book, The Scientific Principles of Strength Training, that Chad co-authored with Dr. Mike Isertel and Dr. James Hoffman. Guys, this was an absolutely outstanding episode with Chad. I know you're going to love it. Stay with us. Okay, Chad Leslie Smith, we are on and recording. So first off, thanks a million for hopping on like me. I know it's early for you over there in California. And, oh, thanks uh, for having me, Robbie. Oh, what was that? I said thanks, thanks for having me. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Of course, we, have, just, we haven't spoken in a while. When's the last time... I mean, I know we haven't seen each other since you were in Ireland in 2014. You were recently uh, here last year. You delivered a, a few seminars, didn't you? Yeah, I was uh, Dublin, Limerick, up to Belfast. Just don't tell the uh, the customs people of the UK that I was in Belfast. But yeah, I did a, a little bit of a tour all, all over. Yeah, so I'm the uh, the owner and founder of Juggernaut Training Systems, um, which we provide coaching for powerlifting and weightlifting athletes, uh, as well as a little bit of strongman, um, and as well as creating content uh, across uh, mostly YouTube, YouTube and podcasts these days. Um, yeah, we're very proud of the work we do there. As an athlete myself, I was a two-time collegiate national champion in the shot put, then transitioned to powerlifting, where I totaled the thousand fifty five kilos in uh in wraps uh it's twenty three twenty five and a thousand ten kilos in sleeves uh twenty two twenty six um also, after, after a severe back injury as well yeah both of those were were after a couple of herniated discs yeah um i guess prior to that in in powerlifting uh, i started powerlifting in two thousand ten and then uh, did that for a couple of years, then transitioned to strongman for a bit, became a professional strongman in 2012 when I won the North American Strongman Championships. Um, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much the gist of the, of the athletic resume, I suppose. And now coach uh, powerlifters across the world, some of the best powerlifters in uh, tested and untested lifting like marissa inda ipf world champion ipf world record holder andy huang brandon allen uh just a lot of real strong guys and girls yeah and obviously in the in the show notes i'm going to link up everything to juggernaut and like the education and information and also the quality of the actual like not only the quality of the content but actually like the quality of the production is like so good and oh thank you got yeah, to give it a you uh, shout out to max as well montana yeah, max you're, you're a psychic. <laughs> yeah, we've 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 definitely come a long way in the in the YouTube game. Um, you know, I, I think I started that channel and probably ten like ten years ago, maybe mm -hmm. eleven years ago, uh, and it was it was just kind of my own training clips and stuff of uh, when I was coaching high school football. I put the put the guys up on there so they could show their friends and did a lot of you know barely editing myself. But now we have a a great videographer, a uh, guy named Shorty Sedang, who's also an oui. excellent power lifter, like a 220 kilo deadlift at 56 kilos body weight. And uh, I keep him pretty pretty busy between three videos a week and podcasts and everything. It's so funny uh, that like he's also like a power lifter because yeah. like, when I was at Altus, it was like the same. It was like one of the athletes there. Like, yeah. He did all the, the social media and stuff when I was yeah, at Jerkman. It's nice. It makes it easy because a lot of the stuff he's filming, we don't have to explain to him the context of anything. He gets it already, so it makes it a bit uh, smoother for us. Sweet, sweet, great stuff. Yeah, great stuff. So, Chad, I'm going to try and keep these interviews like as as uh, topic specific as possible. Because personally, myself, and probably like you, whenever you're like going through an educational resource, be it an online video product or a podcast, particularly with podcasts. Like a lot of podcasts, they can kind of go on and on and on, and you're kind of having to search for the nuggets. So I just want to get straight into the gold. So the reason right. I wanted to bring you on, and actually, you know, you're going to be one of our first guests um, outside of the outside of an OPEX team member. I want you to come on and speak about the scientific principles of strength training, 
So uh, a book that you co-authored with um, Dr. Mike Isertel and Dr. James Hoffman. Um, believe it was released in 2015 because I, I read it in the summer of 2015. Um, fantastic book. And as I always kind of say, it's like a, it's like a layman's textbook. It's not it's not quite as like difficult to read as like a real like like um, third education textbook, but it's way more in depth than your average PDF or book just written by uh, some guy with an opinion piece. So I just want to get into the scientific principles of strength training. Um, and the reason that I wanted to come on was I feel that this as an early episode will lay a great foundation for future episodes because again, it's, it's an episode we can refer people back to. And also too, even though the book is called the scientific um, principles of strength training, me and you both know and a, lot of, and a lot of viewers and listeners know that these principles are applicable to all sports training. So maybe just uh, get into First off, why did you guys think that book needed to be written? Um, I think I heard some of the stories before, like people were going up like to Ilium or something, and they were like, let me know your training and all this. Yeah. And we were just like, right, we got to write a book about like principles of training here. So why did you guys write the book? And then we'll get into the seven principles that you outlined. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the biggest impetus for, for wanting to write the book was uh, that, that there's so many ebooks and, and stuff out there, and I'm guilty of contributing to this myself, that are are – yeah, you know, the juggernaut method or the cube method or or whatever, and it's it's that person's program, but they they don't they didn't necessarily describe programming, and there's a big difference as a coach or an athlete versus understanding a program, the program that you do, versus understanding how to create and adjust programs for different populations and different goals. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, what the the aim with the book was really just to be descriptive rather than prescriptive uh, to help people understand how to create programs for themselves um, and to be able to, to be able to create programs for themselves, their clients, you know, athletes they coach and continually adjust, adjust those because I get questions that on their face are really simple seeming questions uh, yeah. like how many days a week should I squat? And people want me to give them an answer. They want me to tell them two days a week is the best, three days a week is the best. But as, as I do these, these seminars and clinics around the world, I've probably done about 200 plus of those uh, over the last six years. Um, yeah, and I look at, out at a room of 30 or 50 or 100 people, and there might be 30 or 50 or 100 right answers there. And for me to to tell them that three days a week is the best would be doing them a disservice. And I didn't want to do that. Uh, I want to help them dive a little bit deeper into it and understand the, the reasoning behind the answer so that they can have an answer for themselves, for their clients and athletes, um, for themselves now versus a year from now versus five years from now versus 10 years from now. And I think we achieved that about as well as we could have with the book. Mm -hmm. Great stuff, man. You must've put in some amount of air miles. Uh, yeah, I, I got a pretty good, uh, pretty good American Airlines uh, uh, frequent flyer setup going now. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's kick in then to the seven principles, and they're laid out in a hierarchy. So from most important to least important. So uh, most important being specificity, then overload, fatigue management, then our stimulus recovery adaptation, variation, phase potentiation, and finally individual differences. So starting off with specificity. It was funny because I had mentioned this book to Greg Half, and I don't know if it was just a phone call that we had or was it actually on one of the podcasts. And I was saying to him, no, what do you think? Uh, did you ever look into the book that Mike and, and Chad and James um, wrote? And he'd gone, no, oh, not yet. And I was trying to explain to him the hierarchy. And like we didn't really get into it, but I remember mentioning like, oh, specificity is their most important. And he goes, well, I would challenge that idea. And then I explained to him, well, you have to like read the book and listen and talk about it. And then you'll probably see where they're coming from. Because I love the, I don't know if it was... I know Mike gave the example of, he's like, he's like, uh, why specific is one? He's like, you know, if your goal is to be a powerlifter and we go and do loads of running, um, but yet there's progressive overload and fatigue management and, uh, you know, we're following SOA curves. He's like, but we're doing the completely wrong thing to get better powerlifting. He's like, we've completely violated probably the most important principle. So anyway, so I'll let yeah. you take off with the uh, specificity and you can just get into that as deep as you want and maybe touch on to the over and under application of specificity. Yeah, you know, uh, specificity being the number one principle is it really go, ties back to what you'd said a little bit earlier about how the book can be applicable to, to any goal. Mm. And 
you know, the examples that we give in the book are framed by the idea of specificity for powerlifting, but whatever is specific to the sport, the, the same principles will, will still exist, but how they're applied, you know, the, the principles two through seven, how they're applied will all be guided by specificity. Yeah. And it is specificity that creates essentially this framework for all of the other training decisions. So, you know, in, in trying to properly apply it, you have to identify what makes someone successful in, in a given sport, what is important to success in the sport. So for powerlifting, you know, things that are related to success are muscular size, you know, general strength adaptations, the neural adaptations and, and technique, um, where, you know, if like the OPEX uh, listeners, if they wanted to frame that towards CrossFit, specificity becomes uh, a, a much more convoluted idea, maybe because you don't exactly know the target all the time, yeah. but you'd be, you'd be able to look at, you know, different physical qualities. You know, technique is going to be so much more broad in that, and you're going to introduce, you know, aerobic components and, and lactic capacity as well as the maximal strength and everything. And it's, it's choosing. So what, whatever the goals are of, of the, the given task, and and the and uh, you know even a general fitness client could have specificity related to their goals of like you know wellness and and physique improvement and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Whatever is specific to those goals is going to create the framework for all the other decisions. And in powerlifting and weightlifting, where you know we do most of our our work at Juggernaut, I think we. We really see people more often now falling into a trap of over specificity um, in that they only want to do the most specific things and and the most extreme example of this would be like a bulgarian style training where where someone you know we, we tell someone at a seminar specificity is the number one principle the most specific thing you can do for your sport for, for powerlifting one rep max in the squat bench and deadlift to the competition standards. And they just want to latch on to that idea and said, well, Chad said that that's the most important thing. So that's all I should do. Um, and, and then they end up over applying it and missing out on some of the, the later principles, you know, aspects of overload from a volume standpoint, um, you know, variation uh, and phase potentiation qualities. So we see people falling into that trap in both powerlifting and weightlifting. And then the other side of that would be an under application of specificity in which uh, lifters or coaches are having, are creating programs where they're either choosing things that are sort of superfluous to their success in the sport. So someone who does powerlifting and, and, and they also want to do a lot of endurance training alongside it. If that's, if that's what someone wants to do, they want to, you know, run the half marathons and do powerlifting meets, that's fine. As long as they do that with the understanding, they're not going to be the best at powerlifting uh, by choosing, you know, training that's, that's not specific to their goals. Um, so they, they could either have, you know, conflicting training modalities that are sort of detracting from, from the, the specific goal, or they could have a misapplication in uh, specificity through exercise selection, you know, ch choosing too very too wide a variation of exercises. Uh, you know, often see people who are trained in the conjugate system falling mm -hmm. into that trap, and it's not inherent to that necessarily. I just see it happening more so in in that uh, in that group. But but yeah, that's that's sort of the the quick overview of it is that specificity is the framework in which all other training decisions are made. So whatever, you know, if, if it's powerlifting here, or it's weightlifting over here, or CrossFit or, or endurance training, track and field, football, whatever it is, that uh, understanding what makes an athlete successful in that sport and what is most pertinent to, to achieving uh, your goals within that sport, making sure that the training is directed towards those ideas without um, – yeah, you know, sort of diverting into into other training modalities that may either just be 
you know, a waste of time and that they're not creating any positive benefit or maybe even being detrimental to, to the primary goal. I think too, uh, with the over application, um, and this is something we're probably more, more than likely going to touch on, particularly when we get to individual differences, but it's something you mentioned numerous times through the video series. And that's something else I'm going to definitely link up in our show notes is that Chad has a video dedicated to each one of these principles and they're phenomenal, very in depth, very in detail. Um, would you touch on in a few of those videos on a number of occasions, you know, uh, this idea of someone going, well, uh, what training are you doing? So like they go to like, again, they look at your training or the training of Ilium or uh, Andre Milanovic. And you always have this great sort of answer, like saying, don't ask what train they're doing now. Ask them what train did, did they do to get there? And because that can lead people then to like this getting into like an over application specificity too soon for where they're at in their current lifting career. Definitely. And, and yeah, I mean, that's going to tie in and, and all the principles are, are related to each other. That's going to mm. tie in probably the most to phase potentiation and, and individual differences. But uh yeah, I think particularly with the Bulgarian system, which is yeah, the most specific training possible and probably the most popular, very specific training system possible and something that you know, Max is uniquely qualified to speak on. He trained in that manner for uh, about 13 years and I always find it funny when, when people in YouTube comments want to like try and tell him about, uh, no, 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 it really works like this because I've been doing it for six months. Like, you know, Max lived that shit under Abjay, I've even. Um, and, and, uh, yeah, when, when the people want to do that, they, they misunderstand that what those lifters were doing, it was the culmination of, of their career. It didn't take into account, you know, like uh, the example I use a lot with Ilya Ilyan, who trained in that manner as well. We heard Ilya speak at a seminar and he, he talked about starting training for weightlifting when he was six years old. Mm. And at, at six years old, he, he said through the translator, and I quote, uh, I would run around the gym and do all the exercises. Yeah. And, you know, having an understanding of like the process of acquiring sports mastery and, and, you know, the culture of a Kazakh weightlifting gym, I don't think a six year old had free reign playtime. You know, but <laughs> what it probably meant is he did a highly varied training plan that included, you know, gymnastics based training, track and field based training, calisthenics, weightlifting drills, um, you know, swimming and, and just playing general playing games like basketball and stuff to, to develop his coordination. And he said at 18 years old, he had, and again, I quote, he had no weaknesses. So he entered into a Bulgarian style training where he would really just do the lifts, um, front squat and back squat at, at the later parts of his career, just the front squat, maybe a variation of doing the lifts from blocks rather than from the floor, but highly, highly specific training. And, you know, I would venture to guess that from age six to age 18, you know, he progressively became more and more specific throughout that time. Uh, you know, cutting out or at least de-emphasizing some of those general training, uh, making that part of the year a shorter phases. Um, and I talk about that in an article I have called "The Pyramid of Strength." Yeah, and uh, well. great article. And thank you. And that yeah, you know, that further goes into the the relationship between specificity and athlete qualification. Yeah. All right. Well, then getting into our second principle and. Um, the one that's ranked second most important then is overload. Um, and, you know, I suppose like it's, it's pretty self-explanatory to a degree, but I suppose it's that there's many ways to overload. You know, we have, we have intensity, we have volume, we have density, we have frequency. Um, and then even like if you're getting to things like sp skill acquisition, like sports skills, maybe out in the field, there's um, cognitive and perceptual overloads you can do by the way you manipulate certain drills within certain contexts there too but so maybe sticking more towards just the principles for strength training because it's maybe more easier to conceptualize at first you want to just get into the principle then of overload yeah so the principle of overload is is really looking at is the training stimulating enough to drive adaptation so is it heavy enough to make you stronger is it voluminous enough to uh, induce hypertrophic gains uh, certainly there's a lot of different ways and this ties in with the next principle SRA um, 
you know, from that volume standpoint, particularly, there's a lot of different ways that that can end up being organized. Things like you mentioned, uh, you know, higher frequency training, density type of training, but but the end result will be in this microcycle or mesocycle. Did I do enough volume to you know promote muscle growth or keep the the muscle that I have? And then was the training heavy enough to elicit the general strength gains and and neural adaptations? I need for the specific goal in the case of powerlifting, increasing Mm -hmm. the one rep max. And then the other part of that is that the training has to become more difficult over time. Yeah. Um, Chad, on that, can you just touch on, I think a lot of people, you know, particularly more maybe sort of beginners or or people just getting into lifting, because when you're a beginner, you're you can only make a gain from session to session and i think then they falsely believe that every session has to be an overload session and where really it's overload over more of a broader period of time could you maybe just touch on that yeah and uh i misspoke before saying sra was the next one fatigue management will be the, the next principle and and that'll get tied in a lot to what you're talking about here is as you become stronger uh, as you become more qualified in in your sport, whatever the the sport is, whether you're a you know, 100 meter sprinter or powerlifter or whatever, mm. each training session, each overloading session you do, each training session that is sufficiently stimulating to drive adaptation towards your goal is going to be that much more fatiguing. And yeah, you know, when you've been when you've been lifting for three months, and you can put you know five more pounds on the bar on Friday than you did on Monday. Yeah, each you're working so far below your your real, uh, you know, your real career peak and your real abilities yeah. that it's it's not generating that much fatigue. And you're able to decay that fatigue pretty quickly. Mm. But you know, when when I was lifting my my best, if I was squatting you know 880 on a on a Friday or 400 kilos, I'm not going to be able to turn around and do you know, 405 kilos on Monday, probably not even the next Friday um, because it's generating, it's generating so much fatigue. So you have to be a little bit more clever in the organization of things. Uh, that's where we'd get into to more kind of undulating periodization schemes, um, light days, all that, all that stuff to not accumulate fatigue too quickly and then you know, run into the, having like an every other week deload um, mm-hmm. which, you know, would, would end up violating overload, likely violating overload because you wouldn't be doing as much hard training in the, in the same time span as, as you could be with a better organization. Yeah. Yeah. Great stuff. So then going into fatigue management, then our next principle, and this is where the first time I heard of the term maximum recoverable volume. And I know since that, since the scientific principles have been released, Mike has actually kind of updated his thoughts on that with the recovery book you brought out with James. Um, but I suppose maybe let's get into this concept of fatigue management, uh, maximum recoverable volume, um, and then this was an under an application of the, these principles. Yeah, so the training that you do is only as effective as what you can recover from. Um, mm-hmm. you know, good, smart training is going to be very hard training. Like you, you can't sort of, you know, trick your way to, or, you know, outsmart your way to having a bunch of muscle and, and lifting a shitload of weights because it requires a lot of hard work. But in doing that hard work, you're going to accumulate fatigue, uh, fatigue through all different systems, you know, neural fatigue, muscular fatigue, stress on the joints and, uh, connective tissues, uh, technical fatigue, and, and all of these are, are going to you know, play a role to, to different degrees and through different phases and athletes of different levels are going to induce different amounts of fatigue. You know, the deadlift generally is more fatiguing than the squat, which is generally more fatiguing than the bench press. So being able to, to manage all these properly uh, through you know, the correct application of the principal overload through, you know, strategic sequencing of the training days, which would be, you know, in the principle of SRA and, and strategic sequencing of, of training phases and the concept of phase potentiation and implementing within those lighter training days, you know, light recovery days, deload weeks, um, 
all of those are gonna, gonna play a role as, as well as recovery adaptive strategies, uh, you know, from the, the basis of that being sleep and, and diet to, you know, you get into a bit more elaborate stuff, whether it's temperature therapy, soft tissue therapy, massage, whatever, uh, whatever it may be, everyone's favorite one, compassionate touching, you know, those are, uh, those are all going to be important to this concept of, of managing fatigue so, so that you can do, you know, if, if you have eight weeks before the competition, that's, that's a fixed amount of time. So the way that you're going to, are going to improve the most in that is to be able to fit in the most overloading training that you can effectively recover from. So being able to organize the training in such a way, uh, you know, through the use of light days and deload weeks, so that you can, you know, push up your fatigue levels through these, through the different benchmarks of like regular training at or below the MRV, the maximum recoverable volume, into uh, the concept of overreaching, hopefully mm-hmm. functional overreaching, not non-functional overreaching, and avoiding the concept of overtraining, uh, which is definitely a real thing. And, and yeah, in powerlifting and weightlifting, I usually tell people at seminars like, yeah, overtraining is a real thing. People who tell you online that it's not or are are lying you know lying or misunderstanding things or they just never train hard enough but if a powerlifter or weightlifter was to get overtrained they're one very very bad at writing programs and yeah. hopefully with books like scientific principles of strength training they can avoid <laughs> being that bad at it and two they're very tough so tough that they can keep training hard when their body is screaming at them to stop you know, when their body is telling them all that, all that they're sleeping bad, a little sex drive, a little appetite, all you know, motivation to train. Um, but in sports like CrossFit, in you know football, rugby, where there's a lot of different uh, pieces of the training to manage, MMA maybe the the toughest one of this. I'd say MMA and CrossFit probably the mo- the most yeah. inclined towards overtraining because that's where you, I think you get the most coaches involved that someone has a gymnastics coach and a weightlifting coach and an endurance coach or they have a boxing coach and a wrestling coach and a jiu-jitsu coach and a strength and conditioning coach and if those people aren't all on the same page um yeah non-functional overreaching and then the chronic state of that overtraining is is more likely to exist but uh you know we use the concept of mrv and then it's it's sort of uh, other categories that Mike has developed since then of minimum volume, minimum effective volume, maximum adaptive volume to help identify, you know, how much training can the athlete tolerate in a week? Um, and then, you know, with the principle of overload working in with, with fatigue management, we see how to progress that from week to week to you know, microcycle, 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 mesocycle to mesocycle to make sure that they're training as hard as they can be, but not harder than they can. Yeah. Just great stuff. I've known them. I've been actually on to Mike and James. We're getting them on to talk about the, about the MRV book, about the recovery book, or sorry, the training volume book and their recovery book. Mm-hmm. But just a question that comes to my mind with MRV, Chad, is like in the book, it's presented very and i don't mean this in a in a in a bad way like it's presented in a very sort of old school way like you know week one week two and then week three you hit it and then you're going to recover but as me and you both know like the human organism is is a, is dynamic and it's non-linear and i suppose that's why things like rpe and and the um auto regulation kind of put forward and made popular by mike Tashir have kind of been in vogue the last year two three four um and a lot of people are using the auto regulation how do you use RP with your athletes? And like, you know, like I'm sure it's a thing that still fits into a mesocycle. Like you have a mesocycle plan, but within that mm-hmm. is a dynamic fluid flexibility where, okay, if we're not feeling it today, we can back off volume and intensity. So maybe just touch on that for the viewers and listeners. Yeah, certainly. You know, a if we were to, let's say, identify an athlete's uh, MRV is 18 sets per week in the squat. I'm more John, just, 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 just sorry to cut across. Just for you to go on there, how would you determine that? Is that just trial and error? Uh, it's it's trial and error. Um, you know, at, at this point, we we have a lot of indicators between you know athlete training age, biological age, gender, yeah, gender, strength, height, weight, things so you, that can help. 
Yeah, you yeah. kind of have like a, a bandwidth or like a sort of, uh, as Dan John would call it, say, a postal code area. Yeah, so we can help inform um, that decision. I'll talk more about that when we get to individual differences. We can help inform like the best starting point to identify their MRV. So yeah, we have these these ranges from from what we've observed and and Mike, you know, looking at all the different studies and stuff that uh, you know maybe maybe the range for the squat is we see is eight to sixteen sets per week. Well, based on all the, these different factors, we can help them hone in. Okay, you're probably you know, more like 12 to 14, and then through trial and error, they can figure it out further. Mm -hmm. So a more beginner athlete is, is probably fine to have that very linear relationship. We know, that four, you know, we know that 16 sets is their MRV. So week one, they do 12 sets. Week two, they do 14 sets. Week three, they do 16 sets. Then they take a deal. Yeah. MRV and fatigue management gets clouded by... You know, transient outside, transient yeah, transient yeah, yeah, lifestyle factors outside stress. Yeah. You know, it, it would be very simple if we were all, you know, East German, you know, training soldiers and we had nothing in our lives to do besides, you know, train, obvious. sleep, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> besides train, sleep, and eat. I uh, didn't have to worry about work or school, or relationships, all the, you know, paying your bills, all these kind of things that adds stress and, and maybe impede uh, fatigue because your body doesn't, your body doesn't know the difference between mm -hmm. squats and deadlifts and a, an argument with your missus and a, a exams at, at school. Hey, but, but Rocky, Rocky still beat Rigo. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, <laughs> but it, it does know stress and all, and all these factors. So as, as those factors become harder to predict, um, it may, it may become harder to predict which days you're going to feel the best for for your training um so certainly auto regulation stuff can can come into play there i i do use rpe in writing programs for for our training groups and and uh, giving programs to more higher intermediate and advanced athletes with the athletes who i work with on um, the closest you know marissa Kristen, andy brandon those type of people I really just write out all of their weights at this point. And, uh, you know, Marissa, I'll write her entire training cycle, you know, t 10, 12, or 12 weeks going up to IPF World Championships. We're in week three or two and a half of the training right now. And uh, can pretty much predict everything at, for her at this point. And with that, it's not going to be a linear relationship of we do more and more and more than the week before. Yeah. But uh, with her, I, I use what I call an alternating uh, periodization where one week she's, she deadlifts hard, uh, heavy, and then the next week is a lighter deadlift with heavier bench and squat, and they sort of alternate on the way up like that. That works well for her, even though she's extremely advanced, she is still very short and light, and the, the weights are relatively, to her, incredibly heavy. But her, you know, 150 kilo squat will never be as fatiguing as Brandon Allen's 425 kilo squats. So with guys like Brandon, Andy, myself, uh, Steve Gentili, or any any lifters who have a diminished recovery capacity, so this could be useful for like a masters lifter, even though they may be lifting much less weight, or someone who does like shift work or has a high stress job. We get into uh, I use a, a high, medium, low strategy mm. in which it, it alternates. You know, we have our our, primary, our squat days, and that works through a lighter day, medium day, heavy day. And as as you know, and all the listeners know, you have a really hard day of training. How do you feel the next day? You know, very run down. So that's why we we kind of try and predict predict the fatigue levels within that, and and I find that that allows me to give a lot more. Uh, direction to the training and and predictability and that we we can better identify well, this athlete you know usually four days or five days or nine days after their heavy squat is the next time that they are feeling really strong uh, so we can peak for a competition more effectively so is that a trend that you would see generally in that the more um the higher the qualification of the athlete, the more variance needs to be within their microcycle in terms of like high, medium, and low. 
to you know to manage volume and, and manage intensity and density and then essentially fatigue um it doesn't have to be, but but the way that I generally write the programs, it, it normally will be because it you you could have less like modulation or undulation between sessions, mm. um, but I don't think that you'd be able to get as as significant of overload. If yeah. you're going to have you know a really hard session for someone who's really strong, then they're they're going to have their next session will have to be a, a pretty significant reduction. Um, yeah where I, I, I tend to think, and it, it's a bit phase dependent. Exactly. Um, so I was about to ask that question. Is yeah. it end on, is it hypertrophy strength or peaking? And there's so much yeah, so, to it anyway. Yeah. So as you get into to strength and peaking and it's, it's a uh, high, higher neural fatigue mm. being generated to elicit that the neural adaptations you're looking for, you have to lift these higher percentage weights. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's gonna that's gonna be where we really get into like a big session early in the week to a much smaller session later in the week because the neural fatigue is so high from the first session. Where in hypertrophy training, where it's not generating as much neural fatigue, then you could have a you know more similar sessions throughout the throughout the week because you don't have to really push that aspect of principle of overload to get the adaptations you're looking for. Just uh, before we move on to stimulus recovery adaptation. Um just an interest to get your thought on this question. Speaking to James Fitzgerald from OPEX, and he often talks about maximum physical potential. And um, he gave a, a great, he made a great point in saying that what he's noticed with individuals with backgrounds, say as first responders, or they work in the fire brigade, or they're like maybe they're very high up in the police force, so they're constantly in high stress situations, soldiers in the army. So people who, who are routinely in high stress situations and therefore have to um have to go into the fight flight mechanism an awful lot he would say that because these guys they mobilize adrenaline a lot more than your regular individual that he's had to be a lot more cautious with the prescriptions of his exercise programs for these guys in terms of like very high loads and because one, obviously, they could potentially get overtrained, potentially. Um, but the other reason, he says, because they actually won't be able to reach their maximum physical potential because basically they'll have tapped out the nervous system before it got a chance to reach its potential because they were, they've had so many more exposures of acute high-stress situations than, than other people, really. So just my question to you would be, if, if you do someone who, who frequently does engage in fight-flight activities due to their jobs and, and other demands in their life, uh, does that impact then on, on how you would spread out their volumes, intensities, densities, frequencies, programming, essentially? Yeah. Uh, I mean, if they just have, if they have that type of job that's generally more stressful and, and probably more physical to go along with it, uh, yeah, that's something from a lifestyle factor that's going to lower their MRV. Mm. So right away, they're going to be doing less overall training uh, because they're getting more stimulus and, and more stress from their their you know, their job. Mm-hmm. Um, I could definitely agree with him that that if they have a lot of you know a, a lot of work type of stress, which is going to be more neural stress, um, that compounding on top of that with more high neural stress uh physical training is probably not going to be the best the best route so you're gonna maybe get more effect for them with you know lower intensity ranges and and relatively higher volume though the whole thing is still relatively lower volume because of of the reduced recovery capacity from from the work stress Hmm. um but yeah, that, I'm doing you know, more straight across type of sets, maybe uh, you know more light technique type of sessions, with the hope that from a competitive standpoint, there's going to be able to be some management closer to competition of being able to bring down that work stress to yeah. whatever degree you can, so you can have you know the, the the neural side of things be ready for the day that it matters. You, someone could say, well, like, you know, stress management and perception. But usually when we're talking about stress management and perception, that's more psychological stress where you, you physically, you know, you, you can actually control your psychological stress by how you perceive the environment. But these guys actually have to tap into neural stress mechanisms yeah. 
so like it's like you know you can't shut that off like mentally you know you got to tap into these so that's that's just why I was an excellent point that that James brought up and the problem is as you probably know these are the very types of people who want to to go heavy and hard so yeah. it's hard to drag these guys back then you know within the gym because it's probably a dopamine thing too or as, as in a reward thing like they feel they need to get that adrenaline going every time but if they keep spiking it it's obviously gonna there's gonna be some adaptive resistance to that which um which leads us in now to uh stimulus recovery adaptation which is our, our next principle i'm not gonna like out of all seven principles this was kind of the one it took me a while to get better at teaching other people like getting people to kind of understand so i know in the book you guys touch on the recovery time curves for technique hypertrophy uh, neural mechanisms and then the soft tissues and connective structures so if you want to get into um, stimulus recovery and adaptation yeah so so this principle is is going to come in most come into play the most when trying to uh decide on proper frequency of training for the for the athlete so going back to the kind of big simple on its face question that i posed earlier how many days a week should i squat uh the principle of SRA is going to be why there's so many potential right answers uh, for that. So, which you know, means it depends, people. Yeah, and uh, you know, people don't like getting the answer. It depends, but yeah, you know, it does. I'm not going to tell them. I'm not going to give them a, a simple answer just just for the sake of of giving something black and white. In a, hence, a, hence the book. Yeah, and. Uh, so as we get into the principle of SRA, every everything that we, we do in training, you know, presenting that stimulus is going to generate different levels of fatigue, and and those different levels of fatigue are going to take longer to recover and recover from and adapt to. Um, so when we're in hypertrophy training, you know, the hypertrophy SRA curve is largely muscular, some of the connective tissue. Uh, which are, tend to be shorter SRA curves compared to uh, the neural SRA, which is going to be longer. So we could we could introduce more frequent uh, training, more frequent overloading sessions there, or you know, uh, and and it still has to be managed. You know, if, if we do a eight by eight in the squat one day, and we're like, well, Chad, so we can do it more frequently. You ain't going to come back and do that. Yeah, the next day or two days, two days later, uh, in most cases, again, it still depends on other, on other factors, but, yeah. but just those, those muscular efforts don't take as long to recover from, and, and by recovery, I mean just a return to baseline, the ability to, to do the same thing again. Um, so you can, you can do that more frequently, but as, as you get into peaking type of training where the neural adaptations are are more critical the neural SRA curve is going to be longer so you'll have less frequent overloading but with that you know the other goal of a, a peaking block kind of for whatever sport neural adaptations and technical prowess you know sporting skill uh technique is a very short SRA curve mm. so if if neural if the neural fatigue is a long SRA curve and technique is a short SRA curve but we need to put those into the same training block then it, it can become a little bit uh, problematic and, and you have to get a bit more creative. So that would be where the, the role of like a technique session would, would come into play. The example I like to use here, uh, you know, far away from, from powerlifting and weightlifting would be something like a golf swing. Yeah, I, love, I love this. I used to use this as yeah. students too because of technique, yeah. Yeah, you'd never find a, a professional golfer, a PGA golfer, who you know plays 18 holes on Tuesdays and Saturdays with his buddies? Uh, it's you know 18 holes in the morning, 18 holes in the afternoon, six, seven days a week like that, because the golf swing is so fine tuned technically, and you know all these these small changes in technique based on the different shots that you need to make, um, and is is very low, uh, you know very low fatigue from the neural standpoint from a muscular connective tissue standpoint because the club is light yeah it's moving fast but it's 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 not you know really going to beat you down mm -hmm. there so you have to you have to do it very very frequently and if you had a professional golfer who only played once a week as many people will only squat bench or deadlift once a week they would feel very rusty you know for lack of a better term uh when they came back to that and it's not quite as apparent in in powerlifting and weightlifting movements but uh 
you know, is that same level of rustiness is going to uh, exist to some degree. So then we have to manage the overload um, of, of the lifts, you know, to satisfy fatigue management and fit it fit within this this more strategic SRA structure as you get closer to competition with yeah, you know, even the frequency of the lifts could increase, but the frequency of the overloading sessions may decrease. So yeah, you know, I have I've had times where in my own training at, during a peaking block, I would squat five times a week uh, compared to like two or three times during the other phases. But that's that five times is like, you know, Monday I would I would have my overloading deadlift session and a moderate squat session. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, I would have these very, very light technical sessions. For, for me in the squat, those might, may have only gone up to like 170 kilos, which you know, was 20, 25, 20% at the time, um, because I found that that was a weight that I could actually feel my technique at. It was pretty much the lightest weight that I could tell the difference of good technique and bad technique you, you, do, realize, you do realize a lot of males just hung yeah <laughs> yeah of technique yeah, I, I do technique with your max like uh, for three days yeah. and it, and it's all you know it's all relative but but being able to identify that lightest weight that you can you can actually make technical adjustments with because if it's if it's too light you know if, if it's a baseball player a pitcher throwing a wiffle ball it's too light and he can't tell the difference between, you know, his different arm angles and everything in the squat. If it's, if it's an empty bar and it, and it's, it's whatever is too light for that specific athlete, they can't tell uh, my weight was a little too far forward and my foot or a little bit too far back or, you know, the timing with my, my hips and, and shoulders out of the hole was a bit off. So I was able to identify that lightest weight. I could feel that that was at 170 kilos so I could do very small but focused sessions on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, uh, which helped me develop my technique. You know, going into the meet, the most important time to have your technique the sharpest. It provided some active recovery benefit mm -hmm. because I was getting blood flow to the exact muscles that were going to be involved in the squatting. Mm -hmm. um, and it sort of primed my body for Friday's overloading session. So yes, I squatted five times a week but it was one big workout, one medium workout, three very small workouts. Um, and that all goes to the concept of SRA because I was satisfying those short technique SRA curves, you know, without disrupting the longer neural SRA curve from the previous week's, you know, very heavy squatting session. Um, so yeah, that's a, a very brief look at SRA. Yeah. Yeah. Great stuff. And you know, with, with SRA, just a, a kind of additional question. So I, I've seen some different SRA curves where they've had the, the neural mechanism recover faster sometimes than the muscular one. Obviously, it's context dependent too, because or if you took like Ronnie Coleman and he absolutely just went well, back in the day, I know he's retired now with hip replacement. Huh. But back in the day, like if he like absolutely destroyed his quads, the SRA might have been seven days on that, you know. Whereas maybe the, nearly he could have been maybe recovered, but still muscularly from a DOM standpoint, it could still be hanging around. But yeah, again, I think people like want to see things go, Oh, look, this is different. And they want to go, well, why is it near one? And because I've, I've, yeah. I've had that question from people too. Yeah. They, they want to pull out the, the one outline example to, to base everything off of. Yeah. 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 Cause they, they, they're just, yeah, they want a, a little bit of controversy or whatever, but yeah. Uh, it's like, I, I could see, you know, Ronnie Coleman's 37 inch, you know, quads having so much tissue to them that they're, that they are going to take longer to recover. And that's so that again, we'll touch on with individual differences, but yeah. the bigger a muscle is generally the longer it takes to recover. Uh, so I, Mike and a lot of his the hypertrophy guide videos we have with him talk about training these small muscles, you know, delts or, oh, or biceps, triceps, uh, with a much greater frequency because it just doesn't take that long to recover compared to, you know, a huge like squat, bodybuilding yeah. style quad workout oh, yeah. with a ton of tissue that gets damaged in it and then a ton of damaged tissue that needs to recover. The reason why I was laughing out to myself was I remember an episode with Mike, I can't remember, was it on, was, was, it, was it one of, he could have been on one of your videos or The Jug Life or could have been with uh, Steve Hall 
on the Revised Stronger podcast, but he was like, guys are always coming up to me and they're like, my, my delts and my biceps are growing. He's like, well, how many times a week do you train? I'm like, once. And he's like, what are you doing? You're an idiot. They can take so much volume. He was like, you know, train them three, four days a week, they'll grow. They're like, but won't they overtrain? No, no, they won't. They're tiny muscles. Well, no, no, Mikey probably said fuck about 27 times during that uh, sentence as well. Yeah, yeah. I made a crack joke about communist, <laughs> communist Russia and stuff like that. <laughs> uh. But just quickly before we move on from SRA, Chad, uh, I think a, a very important point you guys make in the book is that you should not be fully recovered at any real time really it's you know it's you can train certain qualities uh, because they're recovered while other qualities aren't recovered so like i think for instance like connected tissue you were saying you guys were saying like connected tissues like take and, and joints like they take months to fully fully heal it's like well if you took months off uh, you're yeah. getting a hell of a lot of detrain in terms of your physical capacity so i think that's an important point also to make yeah and and I, that goes to the idea you know and ties in with fatigue management that there it's an important part of training and the long-term training process to feel really shitty and there's going to be times yeah. where training feels bad by design and without that time of of training while you feel bad mm. it's unlikely that you'll ever be able to build you know the base of of fitness or hypertrophy uh, that's necessary for long-term success in the sport because if all you ever do is lift when you feel good it's very unlikely that you would have ever satisfied overload within that yeah and actually that's something you touch on too in fatigue management and that like using all these recover recovery modalities and you could be blunt in the adaptations that you're seeking yeah. to get and that, that that's the thing that's kind of become very more sort of pushed out there in terms of people saying eh, you probably maybe don't want to you know do all these recovery strategies when you're kind of blunt in certain adaptations i think uh you know people think like inflammation is bad it's like well yeah. you won't get like any reconstruction if there's no inflammation in the first place yeah and if we were if we were to use you know something like uh omega wave or diagnostic tools like that which when you you know when properly used can be hugely beneficial but you know, if it's giving a, a green, ready to train, yellow, you know, kind of fatigued, but, you know, be mindful of what you're doing, or red, yeah. you know, uh, some state of overreaching, if you're in green all the time, you know, that you're never training hard enough to, to elicit the level of adaptation that you're possible, uh, you know, there should be some green, a lot of yellow, and the occasional red, mm -hmm. and as if you know the stuff you do that elicits the red, then you can, you know, properly put in a, a plan light day or a plan deload to accommodate that. But, but all of, you know, greens, yellows, and reds are all an important part of training. And just before we move on, we'll move on now. That's something that Joel Jameson talks about all the time. And I think like so many people within like our industry or some people don't like the word industry, our profession, if you will, uh, so many people are just misunderstood, you know, so like great cook with the FMS and like, you know, Mike Boyle with single leg training. And then, and then there's like Joel with HRV because I'm, I'd be very good friends with Joel. I know Joel well. And like people constantly ask him that they're like, well, what happens if I'm red? And he goes, it, it's okay to train when you're red. <laughs> and it's like, and if, if all you're getting is greens and oranges, you're, you're not overloading enough then like, you, you know, or if all you're getting is mainly green, some orange and no reds, like you're not overloading enough. So it's a, it's sort of a misconception. And the thing about training with red, it's like, he's like, you can train and compete when you're, so what happens if it's the day of competition, you're red, he's like, you're going to compete. This is that you don't want to constantly train on red over and over and over and over. That's when you're going to start digging a hole. But you, yeah, people think that you should just be green all the time with like HRV and Omega ways and, and mm. like they, they all, I've seen so many people ask that question to Joel and he's like, that's not what I'm trying to get across in this message. So, um, moving on Chad to, uh, variation. Uh, I think this is, this is the one where a lot of people, uh, have a lot of questions or, you know, they've, uh, you know, maybe some opinions on, um, I'm so similar to you in that how I taught this, like, I was like, what's the first thing that comes into your mental variation? Like, change the exercise. And I'm like, yes, but there's so many other things we can do before that. And I'll let you take the floor there on this. Yeah, so so variation is just a, a change to the stimulus that can be achieved a lot of ways. Certainly, the probably the most commonly understood is going to be going to be a, a change in the actual exercise that you're performing. Uh, 
Hmm. But if, if we look at the most specific thing a powerlifter could do is uh, one rep max in the competition exercise, any change to that is variation. So two reps is variation, three reps, four reps, five reps. You know, the higher and higher the reps get, the, the less specific it gets. But it's still, you know, looking at a, a spectrum of specificity of all the exercises in the world. Yeah. You know, 10 rep squat to one rep squat is, you're still over here. It's still, it's still going to be specific to, yeah. to the goal of, uh, of powerlifting. Whereas um, swim, swimming is all the way down there. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be much, much further away. So making, you know, th those type of adjustments, adjustments to the technique of a lift, whether that's, you know, moving your feet out or in, your hands out or in, changing the tempo of the, the exercise, changing, you know, just the, the loading strategy of, of three sets of eight compared to eight sets of three type of thing. That's all variation and, and some degree of novel stimulus to the body. Uh, you could certainly run into the problem of it not being novel enough mm -hmm. to uh, to avoid you know what what's kind of two sides of the same coin that we'll get into now of directed adaptation versus adaptive resistance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and in the same way that those are two sides of the same coin, often so are specificity and variation. That you know the greater variation is the less specificity, and and uh, when when you get too far to the variation side of things, maybe you violate specificity um, in an effort to avoid adaptive resistance. The longer that you train a certain quality in a certain manner, the slower the return is going to come from it. Yeah. Um, so is the, the power, the power law essentially or law, law of diminishing returns. Yeah. Is the other side of this concept of directed adaptation that if you actually want to get better at something, you have to do it. You have to do it for some, you know, amount of focused time, and and the, you know, the magic of of really well designed training is going to be able to push directed adaptation as far as you can before adaptive resistance, you know, builds up too much, and then you change, you change, uh, you know, you apply some variation so you can once again, you know, build up that directed adaptation before adaptive resistance and you know, it kicks in too much. Um, and this would be, you know, where, where I and, and more proponents of more West side type of training are, are really going to, you know, battle against each other is they're talking about really high, highly qualified athletes. So the more highly qualified you are, um, adapting to training very, very quickly and needing to change a stimulus every single week. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I've, I've yet to see an athlete who's actually adapting that quickly. Uh, you know, for powerlifting, I'm about as highly qualified powerlifter that could exist, as are many of the people that I coach. And they're all able to make very significant progress staying within, you know, the same exercise variation for a month plus at a time and creating variation through, you know, loading strategy. Um, and we're able to better satisfy directed adaptation with that without you know violating uh, adaptive resistance and, and directed adaptation has to supersede adaptive resistance in the same way that specificity has to supersede uh, variation mm -hmm. because if, if we're not giving enough time to the development of the skill of a certain exercise you're not going to be able to satisfy the principal overload then within that because you can't lift heavy enough uh, to to elicit the the stimulus and, or to to give the stimulus and elicit the adaptations you're looking for. It's something I've been thinking an awful a lot about lately, um, and I've been doing a ton of reading and research into skill acquisition, mainly because it's part of my master's currently at the moment. But a certain trend I'm sort of seeing is that okay, we know that early on in training most gains are through motor control and neural adaptations and then to further make gains it's really through hypertrophy and you know getting a bigger muscle and then innervating up the nervous system but then we know like as an athlete reaches higher levels of qualification that they're going to eventually reach a ceiling with regards to quantitative overloading so like just like more volume more intensity like that's mm -hmm. going to hit a ceiling now pat davidson did make a good point to me so i asked pat like what do you think about this paradox of like you know athletes need to do more volume but but because they're getting bigger, faster, and stronger relative to their body anyway, they're got, their SRA curves are going to get longer, their recovery times get longer, so then how, how are they going to get more training volume? And he made a good point in saying that he's like, while 
overall training volume actually may decrease over their career, their specific training volume will increase. So specific yeah. training volume will increase. But the other thing, and I'd love to get your thought on this, is what I've kind of come to see um, from some of the reading I've done on skill acquisition and then just going back reading some of the old Russian stuff is that there seemed to be this sort of career progression of motor control gains from motor control, then that plateaued, then it had to be like gain body weight, muscle mass, and just overload through like volumes and intensities and training programs mm-hmm. and you know those variables. And then that did reach a ceiling and also you get more specific with your training. And then when they got to like that ceiling, the only other way then to continue to make gains was variation in their training. Now it wasn't variation maybe to the extent that the Westside program does. Yeah. But like when you read things then like by Franz Bosch and he's like, there's two ways to continually challenge the brain quantitatively with overload, like neurally, he's like, or qualitatively to present, you know, to cognitive, like uh, basically presenting the brain, the brain with a task and a challenge and has to, solu- has to come up with a movement solution for that in a task that's relatively similar but different to your sport specific skills. So like it doesn't have to be a ton different, it doesn't have to have like 400 bands and chains on it. But again, it could be like a grip or a, you could be doing it off slight deficit. And that seems more aligned to like Steco's type of training or sorry, or Shaco, Shaco's type of training. Because I've had a conversation with Kevin Kahn on the podcast and he says that's kind of, that's Shaco's idea is that it's like, it's his skill acquisition, dynamic, dynamic systems theory that he kind of comes at it when a, when a powerlifter reaches a kind of fairly high level in terms of qualification. So like, would you think that there's any truth that have you ever maybe thought of it that way or what are your initial thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, particularly cause you're going to, you're going to run into issues of like staleness and overuse injuries. If all you ever did was the exact same variations, yeah. but it, it is the degree of variation that I think makes, makes That's the, the difference. Yeah. And if we were to think of it as like, uh, uh, someone learning how to ride a bike. You I'm know, just looking up little, notes here just in case you're wondering. Yeah. Like a little kid, you know, they can't ride a bike at all. So just that practice of you know your, your mom or dad pushing you on the bike and, and then they let go and, and that's how you kind of learn the basic of it to then you ride you know you just regularly ride more and more and more to then someone who's doing bmx and doing all these different tricks mm-hmm. like all of those tricks are a variation of of bike riding and if 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 all they did was continue to ride their bikes in straight lines and and you know easy big circles they would never really improve that much but they're they're introducing all these these similar but you know similar but different skills uh in different tricks that they they might try and do it to develop this huge skill as as a bike rider um exactly. and this you know we could take the same idea to a sprinter you know if all they ever did was sprint at maximal speed that the amount of training they're going to be able to do is very limited but you know, tempo is going to be a variation. Skips are going to be a variation. Different bounding exercises are going to be a variation. Yeah, but yeah. they're all still very similar to to sprinting. And the same thing yeah. for the lifts. It's it's just when we when we venture too far away from them that you know you're gonna you're gonna violate directed adaptation or it's going to be a low degree of transfer. Um, and you could look at the Bondarchuk you know, dynamic correspondence tables of you know when someone's throwing the hammer 50 meters what's transferring to their success is you know weight room exercises are going to have a much higher uh Mm -hmm. dynamic correspondence to their success whereas they get up to you know throwing 80 meters the the exercises with high dynamic correspondence are going to be you know overweight underweight different length wires and and, and uh, what previously what previously was having a positive a positive transfer like a weight room exercise is actually now having a negative transfer when they're at that level of qualification yeah yeah so yeah it, it again it's <laughs> the answer is, is it, it, it always depends but yeah, another reason for variation too you guys touch on in the book is uh you know, if you're stimulating the same muscles over and over again, there's going to, could be potential for muscle balance. And then also, like, nearly uh, mediated factors, too. So, like, if you're constantly going, like, you know, over 90, 95%, like, there's going to be an adaptive resistance to the neural system. Like, don't even think about just the muscular system, just the whole organism in general. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm glad you brought up that point about Bondarchuk, too, because, again, in my master's, I had to do a dynamic correspondence essay with the power clean and the block start. And, 
basically one of the conclusions was like the power clean has some transfer and a lot has a bit of transfer it doesn't have a lot of transfer and then the transfer depends too with the with the individual in terms of where they are in their qualification so what 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 would be deemed a general preparatory exercise for one individual usually an advanced athlete would be more might be more of a specific preparatory exercise mm-hmm. for uh a more novice athlete so again like those factors need to be taken into consideration so but yeah. uh, is there any, anything else you want to touch on there with variation before we move on to phase potentiation? Um, I, I, I just say that, that the thing that really needs to be considered with, with variation, and I'll tie right into this next, this next uh, factor is timing is such an a important aspect of it. You know, variation for variation's sake. You know what uh, a, a certain variation might be great at a given time and terrible at a at another time of a of a training cycle or of an athlete's career, and that's going to tie right into the next concept of phase potentiation. Yeah, so phase potentiation. The first time I actually kind of really heard the actual those words was from yourself, and Mike, and then because of yourself, and Mike Israel, I was like, right, I'm going to get this Mike Stone book, the principles of. Uh, Principles and Practice of Resistance Training, which I have right over there on my bookshelf. And I read through that, read that thing cover to cover last year. So by uh, Mike Meg and William Sands. So Mike Meg's on William Sands. Great textbook. And uh, there's so much, you, there's like so much of like, you can see how Mike's been, Mike Gizzard has been influenced by Mike Stone and that. But it's a great mm. book. But in terms of face potentiation, it's another way of seeing it is like block sequencing. So um, face potentiation, you know, that this logical sequencing of blocks that every preceding block should be a foundation for each succeeding block. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna let you take the floor away on um, phase potentiation. Yeah, so the phase potentiation is gonna be applied in, in the short term and, and you know, the short and the long term. Hmm. So I have a, an article a article series about this called uh, Consolidation of Stressors and it's three, three parts and we talk about Brilliant. yeah how, how this can, can change in the, in the course of one training cycle. So 12 week preparation for for a powerlifting meet that maybe we go hypertrophy strength peaking um, and each you know, hypertrophy potentiates strength by you develop this bigger muscle and they, now that bigger muscle has a greater potential for force production. So we teach that bigger muscle how to produce more force in the, in the general strength phase and then we take that bigger, more force producing muscle into peaking uh, and develop the technical prowess and, and neural qualities of the one rep max and then begin again. And even to some degree, strength and peaking, strength more so will potentiate hypertrophy because now you can lift more weight, which can uh, elicit you know, greater uh, hypertrophic, uh, yeah, more muscular damage and a greater hypertrophic adaptation. So then you can have a better hypertrophy training cycle because you're lifting heavier weights due to those phases. It's then, funny you mention that because that was a question I used to get all the time from the students in the personal training college. So like I used to be showing them like a powerlifting phase potentiation cycle mm-hmm. where you know you have your hypertrophy strength and peak and they go well what if you want to gain muscle would you not do strength so you'd be stronger than hypertrophy? Like, yes you can do that there's no right or wrong it depends. Yeah so then, then that would extend out to more of like an annual plan or maybe even a quadrennial in which you're going to have just longer longer phases uh, and the further you get away from competition, you know, 12 weeks away in our first example, still very close to competition. If we're a year away or four years away from the competition that matters most, the hypertrophy phase, which is, you know, the most general phase, may become much more general. Mm. Uh, you know, still, if we're looking at that big, big uh, spectrum of, of specificity and exercise selection, it's now probably just over... Yeah, you know, one one training cycle is here. Yeah, maybe the annual plan or quadrennial is here because there's a bunch of shit over here that just doesn't, you know, that violates specificity and has nothing to do with with uh, success in that sport at, at any uh, aspect of time. So, yeah, you, know, you just have different structure to blocks of of you know true general work capacity GPP type of blocks that will eventually potentiate. You know, maybe more training volume in in hyper in a hypertrophy block as you get closer to competition and more specific for you know the, the goal of powerlifting in mind, mm. and then we could take that out to the to the longest you know an athlete's entire career and breaking that into to different phases. You know, going back to the Ilya Ilyan example from 
from earlier, run around the gym and do all the exercises where you have a sport like, like uh, weightlifting, for example, and, and a lot of people will draw a, a correlation you know, between gymnastics and, and weightlifting. And in the short term, you know, being able to walk on your, on your hands and, and, you know, go on parallel or go on a, a bar or something doesn't have shit to do with snatching and clean jerking at, at a meet this weekend. Mm-hmm. But if I had a room full of eight year olds and I watched them do gymnastics and I got to pick one to start to do weightlifting, I'd probably pick the one who's the best at gymnastics because in that long-term sense, uh, that very, very general quality is going to potentiate, you know, is through greater coordination and, and yeah. maybe some connective tissue stuff and, and explosiveness or whatever, long-term success in that. So you could look at a very, very long-term mm, application brilliant. of potentiation, brilliant. see very general training to develop, you know, coordination and, and these general movement patterns and motor skills, as well as, you know, some psychological aspects of, of love for training and all this stuff for a young athlete. And then through many, many phases, each, you know, the, these phases that now might be three to five or six years long and within them have multiple of the annual plan type of setups, which within each of those have multiple, you know, uh, macro cycle or uh, uh, mesocycle setups within them, you know, then we're going to potentiate an athlete's long-term success. Mm. You know, that they're going to be, if, if we started the process at age six and we said, you know, age six to 10 was, was one phase and then 11 to 15, another and 16 to 20, another, and, and, you know, then 21 through 25 as, as the next one, yes, success in the six to 10 year old phase is going to potentiate, you know, the ability of, of the 11 to 15 year old phase, Mm -hmm. whether it's from coordination or general work capacity. Um, I think that that's something that, that gets overlooked big time a a lot. And, uh, you know, particularly in powerlifting where, where now almost all the records have, have been broken, but there's still such tremendously high results from athletes in like the 1970s. And you would think, well, you know, now there's a bigger talent pool, there's, you know, better nutrition and supplements and, and, you know, more understanding of training. Like how were these guys in the seventies, Don Reinhardt, John Cole, whatever, lifting these massive weights, you know, without the, the benefits of people today. And I think a lot of it could be attributed to you know, a more rural lifestyle. If someone was growing up in the, in the forties, fifties, it was much more likely that they, you know, played outside more or had more like manual labor type of chores. Uh, my mom grew up on a, on a farm in Northern Minnesota and you know, I saw my, my grandpa who had done this farm work, you know, he didn't lift weights, but he lifted hay bales and, yeah. you know, getting clearing out rocks and all this shit several hours a day, every day. Well, if, if you started doing that, you know, helping your dad with those kind of things around the, the, the farm or whatever, when you're six years old and you did it for two hours a day, you know, six days a week from age six to 12. And you've now, you know, I don't know that math off the top of my head, but you now have so many hours of, of general physical preparation under your belt. If someone then starts training at 12 years old, how would they ever catch up to the work capacity that you've developed? Uh, you know, I heard of uh, Naeem Soleimani doing 500 snatches and clean and jerks with the, with the broomstick uh, starting when he was like five years old. Well, let's just think of that as, as basically a, a body weight squat. If I did a thousand body weight squats a day from when I was five until I was 15, how would someone who started squatting at 15 ever catch up you know, the, the volume and, and motor patterning that I had developed through that time. It's, it's, it's almost like, you know, if you hear people talking about retirement accounts, someone who's, you know, 18 and puts $10 into their retirement account a month yeah. because of the compounding interest on it. Well, someone who's, did you read Tony uh, Robinson's book as well? Yeah, uh, no, that's not, uh, I mean, it might be from that. That's not where I got it, but <laughs> I probably got that from my mom telling me to, to, 
you know, save he my money. He speaks about that in his book, and I'm yeah. like, damn, I better start saving. He's just like, because yeah. he, he's like, if you're 18, you're doing it, you're going to be good. But even if you wait till you're about 30, he's like, you're, it's diminishing return. Get going on your compound and interest. Yeah. So, so you know, to to go back to the or, the original idea, be, being able to build up that real general work capacity yeah. when you're six, seven, eight, nine years old is is going to potentiate success so much further down down the road and, Ch- and Ch- not that. even not even like fit from a physical gpp standpoint but because again just because i'm reading so much skill acquisition the, the the there's a hypothesis that from all that deliberate now i know you said some of it was work but let's say when you're younger they're saying because of all this deliberate play so there yeah. be this this discussion between deliberate practice and deliberate play because some people are saying that the ten thousand hour thing is actually a bit of hor- there's a bit of hor- like it's not fully true because the yeah. practice is meant to be like, you know, not enjoyable and you put it in. But then there's a difference between deliberate play, which is like more unsupervised, it's more chaotic, like street football or, you know, mm-hmm. all, like by football, I mean soccer, like here, where like there's no rules and it's just like friends going out kicking a ball around. And what they hypothesize is because the yeah, the young boys and young girls or whoever's, whoever's doing deliberate play, they're exposing their their themselves to like larger um, movement landscapes, which then allows them to have a bigger uh, landscape to choose a movement solution from. So that when they go into like a more specialized sport later on in life, they can tap into like certain positions and, sit, and get in situations to choose to have a bigger uh, movement landscape that allows them to solve more problems and therefore have a higher performance. For sure. So just with, with phase potentiation and maybe more short term. So in the scientific principle of strength training, we're talking about like a, generally a hypertrophy or what's known as a, I think the, Mike Stone generally calls it a, a strength endurance block. He, he more terms it that than rather a hypertrophy block. Or some people might call it a work capacity block like myself or yourself would. And yeah, strength, block. I, I, strength endurance to me would actually be a, a badly done hypertrophy block. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's what he does call. I'll have to double check that, but because uh, I can remember, like he doesn't say a poetry, and he doesn't say work pass. I think he calls it like a strength endurance block or something like that. But it is essentially what most people would understand as a hypertrophy or, or yeah. work capacity block. But I think uh, maybe just for someone who's not into strength training, um, like say for me now, I dealt with a lot of field based athletes. How face potentiation might look when that might be, uh, aerobic capacity might be your block one emphasis with mm-hmm. maybe some general strength. Then block two could be a lactic power maximal strength, and then block three could be a lactic capacity with explosive power or sprint sprint repeatability type stuff. Whereas block two, that preceded that, would be more like just pure a lactic speed stuff. Now in the final block, you're doing like speed repeatability, and then so you kind of went from general strength to max strength to power over the three blocks. You went from aerobic kind of tempo capacity stuff to a lactic power to yeah. And, and this this of course all ties back to to our overreaching or our, our guiding principle of specificity that that what the phase potentiation is going to be if we're talking in the broad sporting sense is least specific to the sport to most specific to the sport you're you know you have a, a football player a american football player you know in two two weeks out of after the end of the season doesn't need to do a lot of seven on seven or inside run drills or anything but right before the season, they're going to scrimmage, yeah. you know, and and the reversing it is is very simple to understand. Like that, that's nonsense. Yeah. So we want to do things that are that are higher and higher transfer the closer that that we get. And mm-hmm. yeah, really, but, that's whatever well, the phase is appropriate to to the goal is how it'll get set up. Yeah, and uh, we'll find we'll move on to our, our last one now. Uh, individual differences, just in a sec, but just to. A final thing I used to always do with the students who and teaching them about face potentiation, I used to like sarcastically say, "Okay, let's say I'm a powerlifter and I'm getting ready for a meeting in in 12 weeks, and this is what you tell this is this is what you tell me the training plans going to be for the first four weeks. We're going to do singles, and you're going to wear all your specific gear, belt and wraps, and you're going to be like on the competition platform, you know, with the actual competition bar, doing your competition style list. That's our first four weeks." Then we're going to transition away from that, take the belts and the knee wraps off and go away from singles, maybe start doing like triples and maybe maybe some fives. And then our final block, just for competition, we're going to like wear no belts, no knee wraps. We're going to go to variations. We're going to do loads of hypertrophy training. Sound like a plan? And then they'd all be, okay, we get what you're trying to say. Because that yeah. would make absolutely no sense. We went from specific to general rather than vice versa. Certainly. 
So final one then, individual difference. Um, and I, I love the way you open up this one in your YouTube video because you're like, this is the one where a lot of people, it's like the supplements of the nutrition hierarchy. You know, mm-hmm. everyone's like, what supplement should I take? Like, well, watch out for breakfast. I didn't have any breakfast. I'm, I'm intermittent fasting where I eat one minute a day and fast for 23 hours and 59 minutes and I'm uh-huh. hoping to gain muscle mass. Like, okay, we need, we need to talk. Uh, but individual difference. So, you know, you cover uh, inter and intra personal differences. So you can get into that. And then you also have these sort of five areas where you touched on, um, which was individual MRV, which, uh, the fitness decay times and training residuals. Then there was the goals of the individual and then technique and um, to, to exercise variation and technique. So we we'll to hop into those. Yeah. So individual differences, I think people often want to uh, give it the highest priority and think that they need. I'm know, a snowflake, very, Chad. I'm a snowflake. Yeah. Some, some very, very uh, specialized training for themselves. But, but really what the, the principle of individual differences does is it dictates the magnitude and application of the previous uh, six principles. That they're all, that they're, they're going to be important for everyone, uh, but the degree you know, what, what is overload for, for one person compared to another person will, will be dictated by these, these, you know, size of the lifter, strength, gender, proximity to career peak, um, lifestyle factors, because all those things are going to, going to play a role in, in, you know, predicting or, or being able to better inform the idea of MRV for them, um, determining you know appropriate frequency for these different athletes as we we said inter and intra individual differences of course there's going to be a difference between you and me but there's also going to be a difference you know for me when i'm six months out from a meet versus when i'm six weeks out you know difference for me when i've been training for a year versus 10 years um you know a difference when you know for students particularly like when they're in finals uh, exams versus during the summer break, you know, because of these, these outside stresses. Um, so all of those are going to, are going to go towards, towards determining, determining that stuff. Uh, I wonder if I can actually, let's see if I, I could do a, a screen share even and show you, show you this, uh, so this was from a, a workshop I did. Are you seeing this? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So this is from a, a programming workshop I did in in uh, Melbourne on April sixteenth, as you can see, and uh, that's probably supposed to say March sixteenth. <laughs> <laughs> that was March sixteenth. I was like, I was I wasn't in Australia last week. Um, so you're looking pretty fresh. Yeah. 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 So March March sixteenth, I, I did this, and I. This part that you can see on the screen here was a, an effort to help the the athlete identify or or inform their best guess towards finding their their MRV. Hmm. So we took these these different factors and I just would go through and circle. So you know, using for myself, male, super heavy, uh, tall, you know, v- very high strength, yeah. advanced, yeah. and you know, on with the lifestyle factors and. All, all of these factors are, are going to, you know, either increase or decrease um, an, an athlete's MRV, or likely going to contribute to increases or decreases with that. So, you know, we have this sort of general understanding of MRV uh, based on observation. This is pretty uh, so, oh, thank you. Yeah, so let's say for the squat, we find during a hypertrophy phase that most people can tolerate between 10 and 16 overloading sets of squats per week. Uh, so for the purposes of this, this workshop, I just had them, we just started in the middle. So we took 13 sets. We split the difference of that, of that sort of known range and then went into this table here and, and based on uh, their answers from the athlete assessment above, mm. we were able to say, all right, you know, being a male generally means less training. So we started out with 13, so now we're at 12 and a half. Uh, being a, a very heavy athlete, and hopefully in that having you know, a lot of muscle mass means more muscle that gets damaged and is harder to recover from. So that's further going to reduce your your MRV by minus one here. So you know we started at 13, then we're at 12 and a half because we're a male. Now we're at 11 and a half, being super heavy. 
uh, if you're tall or very tall, the bar has to move farther with every with every rep. So you know, Thor Bjornsson's doing a lot more work per rep of deadlift mm-hmm. than uh, like uh, uh, Sergey Fedosyenko, you know, IPF world champion world record, but he's like four foot seven. So uh, you know, when the bar moves further, they're doing more work that's more fatiguing. So we take a little bit more off off the likely MRV. The strength level gets gets a little bit uh, trickier and a little bit more convoluted. And I'm still kind of working uh, parts of this out because it does happen in a bit of a, a bell curve. When the athlete is very weak and new to training, um, their special work capacity is very low just because they haven't done much, you know, not factoring in previous training experience if someone's coming from triathlon background and powerlifting. Even though they're a beginner or powerlifter, they might have very high work capacity. Uh, so that one gets a, a little bit, a little bit murkier, and I'm like I said, I'm still kind of working that out a bit. But uh, you know, as as a, generally as an athlete becomes, as they go from beginner or very low work capacity, um, but also very low uh, ability to to dry to generate fatigue. Mm-hmm. Which is, then as they increase the amount of work they can do until they get very very strong and each you know given set or or training session is is they're able to generate so much fatigue with that well we go through this whole chart and then this lifestyle one takes into account age diet sleep work stress and performance enhancing drug use and gives them a score uh, from that if someone has a very good lifestyle score they can tolerate more training versus a, a poor lifestyle score you know is going to further reduce their mrv so we're able to to use these individual differences you know in and and this is by no means like a perfect system but it's a a, i think a effective way for the athlete to to visualize and and represent this stuff and we did the same thing with uh with frequency yeah basically just kind of following along where you circle on this chart we come down to frequency that a lot of the the uh, the high volume factors are going to also tend towards higher frequency. Female athletes, shorter, lighter athletes, uh, weaker athletes yeah, yeah. who aren't able to generate as much fatigue per session. You know, they might tend towards over here on the frequency side of things, and and uh, you know, be able to train need to train the lifts really frequently because they're able to recover quicker where a, a bigger, stronger, more advanced athlete or someone with diminished recovery capacity might be a bit farther over here and not be able to train uh, with overloading frequencies as, as, uh, as off, or overloading intensities and volumes quite as often. So yeah, I won't give away too much of my, too much of my seminar <laughs> presentation. Yeah, I, was, I was just about to say, and uh, yeah. How many how many sleepless nights and whiteboard sessions <laughs> that day? I mean, that, that's the type of stuff that like I, I'm I do be, like in my notebooks of loads of stuff like that, like mm-hmm. volumes, intensities, and you know trying to figure out things. But that that is fantastic. Will will, will that pretend, and is is that purely your own work, or have you done that in conjunction with Mike and James? Or um, I mean, it's it's based on ideas from the book, and I'll ask Mike here and here and there. But that's that's oh, yeah. pretty much my my own my own deal. Is that a book? There. Is that a future book? Do you think? Yeah, uh, hopefully by by the end of the year, I would I would see. I think before Christmas this year, we'll be able to put that that all into a book, and it it really be, yeah. Because if if there is one common complaint we hear about scientific principles of strength training, it's well, it doesn't have any programs in it, <sighs> and even though it is equipping people with all the the tools, uh, it's it's still a bit abstract, maybe, and and too theoretical for some for some people to understand and i think this this is able to bridge the gap between you know the theory and an idea of the principles to the actual program creation and, and help inform all right this is you know the practical implication yeah. of yeah. of this principle and and some some potential ranges that the overload is going to fall within and how to identify you know <laughs> that's the most what common question we get about MRV. Well, how do I find my MRV? And trial and error is, is a big part of it, but is is a very unsatisfying answer to them. So being able to show, you know, practically how these different individual differences impact 
you know, generally impact the MRV. So, you know, if our start, yeah, if our starting range was like, like, okay, we know most people's MRV is, is 12 to 20 sets. So that's a very big range. And that might take them multiple uh, nestle cycles to, to hone in on. But if, if through these, through the individual differences and, and helping them understand their impact, I can take them from 12 to 20 to be able to tell you, know, you that, all right, you're probably 13 to 15. Now they can probably, after one uh, you know, mesocycle, have a very good idea of what their, their MRV is, even though that's, that's even a you know, constantly changing mm -hmm. uh, idea, but, but the, you know, like to, to just give them a better starting point. And that's really what the principle of individual differences will do is it's, it's going to help you better understand the, the magnitudes of application of the previous principles. Yeah. And then from MRV, you go into fitness decay times um, and training residuals. And essentially, like th the way I, it's, I'm always trying to think of a really good way to get tr the concept of, the, you know, of, of fitness decay times and training residuals across to sort of beginning coaches. Um, and I suppose the way, the analogy I always kind of use was the phone and your battery, you know, that like the, the, the kind of the more experience you are, the higher level qualifications, the more charged up your battery is. And then, you know, if you were to leave that, that phone off the charger it would uh, the battery would die like it wouldn't die as fast in terms of if you if you ceased doing training whereas if you're like a beginner who just started training and then you just went off and you did four weeks of training and went off on holidays for like three months all basically all you've done is gone because you, you didn't build up a big training base um so like your your gains are basically just going to be all gone whereas someone who's training 10 years and is a master athlete like their decay time is a lot lot slower in the in the more macro sense but uh, obviously then in the micro sense too, there's going to be a huge difference between, you know, decaying someone's fitness to be able to express or decaying someone's fatigue so that they can express their fitness as well. So maybe just touch on that to the, the fitness, decay, uh, fitness decay timelines. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of those factors are going to, are going to come into play with it. It's going to be largely genetic, uh, also highly pharmaceutically influenced in, in a lot of cases. Um, but the, the, the bigger, stronger, more muscular athlete, um, faster twitch is, is generally going to hold on to, uh, and male athletes will hold their fitness longer than a female athletes, less testosterone, smaller, less muscle mass, uh, doesn't have the same ability to, to hold that. And then the, yeah, the longer training history you have, uh, the better you'll be able to hold on to fitness as well. Mm -hmm. let's let's say if, if i was to have an athlete who had been training for one month you know and then they took a week off they've now not trained for 20 percent of their training career for one of five weeks they didn't they didn't train where you know we have an athlete who's been training for a year and then they take a week off you know they've only missed yeah, you two know, percent of of their training career. So it's it's much more likely that at the end of that week, the athlete with you know fifty two weeks of training under their belt is going to be just about the same as they were a week ago, mm. where the athlete with only four weeks of training it isn't. And and it, you know that's a bit of an extreme example, but I think it illustrates the point. the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then obviously too, there's, di there's different decay rates for different physical capacities and qualities too, you know, as for in sure. like hypertrophy versus strength versus, you know, explosive qualities, you know, so that's obviously in, you know, an insurance book when it comes to things like, um, uh, a lactic and aerobic qualities and lactic qualities or a lactic lactic and aerobic qualities and, and, and the biomotor qualities within that as well. But, uh, last three things in that then are, um, the goals of the individual, uh, the exercise um, variations that someone does, and then exercise technique. Yeah, um, I mean, an individual's goals within the context of the the book, you know, whether it's it's hypertrophy or body composition changes and stuff, are gonna are gonna dictate some changes in in MRV and and exercise selection for sure. Um, you know, the the mus the muscles that that make someone a, you know, if someone's a more tricep dominant bencher versus a pec dominant bencher, uh, that's going to impact their exercise selection. Um, yeah, that's going to kind of go right, right in, 
in hand with the with the exercise technique. Uh, if someone you know squats more like Blaine Sumner or Lane Norton, really you know bent over, they're going to have to choose exercises that are are more about their you know their low back strength versus someone who squats really upright and and doing a lot of direct low back work is probably not going to benefit the. Yeah, you, you uh, give a great example of that in your YouTube video of like Blaine, like he good morning transfers a lot yeah. to his squat, whereas for you who's more quad dominant, you're like good morning does nothing really for my squat. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's kind of the gist of of that. Yeah, yeah. So Chad, uh, wrapping up here, um, obviously going to put all the links in to the show notes in terms of Juggernaut and where people can contact you and the books. Um, and obviously as well, your your membership site. Uh, so I'll get you to plug that. And as I said, that'll all be up in the show notes. But just real quickly, just finishing up here, um, what uh, books, book or books are you currently reading right now? Um None that have anything to do with training. I'm reading a book called Big Boy Rules, which is about uh, private con- pri- private security contracting in Iraq by the same guy, um, Steve Steve Finarua, who wrote uh, Game of Shadows, which is like a Barry Bonds, um, Balco steroid book, and uh, also did the League of Denial, which is like the NFL concussion crisis. So Very good. Yeah. yeah, as as the the books and stuff, a lot of the people, if I if I have questions about training, I would just contact them yeah. and talk to them oh. directly. So. Well, listen to that. Like, I mean, I don't like you know me pretty well. Like, I'm I'm like the most like generalist holistic guy ever you know like i'm reading books mm. on organic agriculture for christ's sake so like yeah. I, I get that to be honest it'd be boring if you just said a training book because I, I love when people like just say purely like random esoteric books so i really uh, like that um what would you say and i'm gonna wrap up soon here because i know you gotta go and you probably need to go to the toilet or go get something <laughs> to eat or something like that what would you say have been the biggest lessons you've learned over, say, like the last four years since since we last met one another? What 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 have been the biggest things you've learned over the last four or five years? Um, I you know I think that my the programs that I write have really developed from a fatigue management standpoint, and and some of these bit more intricate undulations. You know what I what I do is I I don't consider it to be a DUP type of program, though there is intra micro cycle undulations they're mm-hmm. done very strategically and and again trying to do them in a predictive manner um to where I, d- I don't have to give the athlete necessarily the leeway so much of an rpe for the day uh, which i think it's very difficult for people who aren't very advanced or aren't using stuff like uh tendo units and and whatnot to to give them objective feedback. Um, I think it's really tough for, for other athletes to, to be able to really successfully pick their own weights with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in, in some of these, these more kind of creative undulation schemes I use, I'm able to, to dictate to the athlete, this, this is the day you're going to feel good. And this is the day you're going to feel shit mm-hmm. um, based on the, the other work we did, assuming that they can, control the the outside variables as well as possible and a serious athlete should be striving towards you know consistency and diet and sleep and stress management stuff so i think that that's that's certainly an area where we've been able to improve a lot last two uh your top resource to everyone watching and listening and then your top life advice and then i'm going to ask you the, the final big question so top advice and top resource uh, top resource. I mean, maybe I'm biased by the <laughs> Juggernaut Training Systems uh, yeah, YouTube channel. Yeah, too right. Too right. It's unreal. And by yeah. the way, just off that, you, I think one of your best books, the the A Tough Pursuit, is a great book. But oh, I, thank you. I absolutely love your Juggernaut Football book. That was my first exposure to you. Oh. That book is outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. The uh, you know, I think everyone knows me now as just a just a powerlifting coach. Got to get uh, back but, into training some combine. Yeah. Guys. The, uh, but the sports performance aspect of things has always been a lot more interesting to me. It's just mm. more, more challenging. Powerlifting is pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, so I, I appreciate that. I do uh, enjoy that. Yeah, I, I'm genuinely very proud of the content we produce. I think it's the best, yeah. uh, the best that there is uh, yeah, in terms of online right. 
fitness stuff and and striking a balance between yeah you know, information and accessibility um it's it's relatively easy to digest and uh does does that without diluting the quality of the content in my opinion mm -hmm. uh life advice um you know i i would encourage people towards towards if if you want to if you want to do something you know if you have whatever goal it is to to have the courage to to pursue that the, the, there's so many people out there who are going to you know tell you you can't do something or be naysayers or people who will who will never take the risk um the the risk necessary for great achievement you know in whatever field that, that is because they're too scared to begin it so you know, have the courage to be great to to pursue those those big goals. Um, you know, because there's a shitload of people out there with good ideas, but you know, better better ideas than 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 me. But they they'll never actually act on them. Uh, and that uh, that courage and ability to to take the first step is is missed by so many people. So if you can do that, you're you're ahead of the game. As Zach Evanesh said to me one time, comfort is the enemy of greatness. So final one, we're, we're going to dinner, Chad, and you can invite five people, dead or alive. Who are you going to bring to this dinner and why? Five people, that's a shitload. I, uh, Marissa has to come with me. I like hanging out with her, so she, she can come. Um, and they can, know, be dead I, or alive, they can be dead or alive now. Yeah. Uh, I, I got asked something like this uh, uh, another day. It was just one, one person, though, and, and I mean, Malcolm Gladwell is a, a guy that, that's very interesting. To me, and I think he's interacted with so many, cool. uh, yeah, so many incredibly interesting people that by by picking Malcolm Gladwell, it's it's like I get a little bit of the of hundreds of, of different uh, yeah. uh, interesting people that he's gotten to interact with and, and kind of leech off of his uh, his experiences there. He's got a great podcast, uh, Revisionist History, that mm -hmm. covers all sorts of random topics, but is is an interesting one. Uh, five. I, I, I don't know. It's it's just me. Yeah, and you got two and more. You got two more. <laughs> um, two more. Would Max not be there? Uh, I mean, I hang out with Max all the time. The uh, <laughs> Marissa Marissa might be mad if I don't say her. Max. What about Charlie Francis? Would he be there? I know he's been an influence. Yeah, yeah. Charlie. You know, as far as training one, he would he would be uh, he'd be a, a good one to have, and then. Uh, I'll say like maybe Will Ferrell. Will Ferrell is we went to the same high school, grew up in the same town, and he's you know twenty, thirty years older, like twenty right. years older than I am. Right. But uh, yeah, we can we can share some old university high school Trojan stories. And I actually I got to do the the announcements my senior year of high school as I was on student government. And I would do the announcements like every Tuesday, and Will Ferrell showed up one day. This is right before Anchorman came out, which really ages me here. But uh, we did the announcements together. So I pretty much tell everyone that we're best friends from that experience. That's brilliant. That's great. Chad Vazzy Smith, thank you so much for taking time out today. Um, I'm just going to wrap up here now and we'll say our goodbyes offline. But what an absolutely jam-packed episode full of information, exactly what I hoped for, exactly what I predicted. Chad is a wealth of knowledge. Everything will be in the show notes in terms of juggling the train systems, all their social media, website, their resources. Really do check them out. I've got like, everything they've ever sold in terms of books <laughs> and educational resources yeah so i've got i've got like the scientific principles tough pursuit strength the football uh, the juggernaut football juggernaut one juggernaut two all of it even like the books you sold for the other guys um so it's just the resources are incredible your youtube channel is incredible as well it's just amazing so Thank and, you your, and your podcast jug life absolutely fantastic uh, resource as well so uh chad thanks so much for taking time today and for all the viewers and the listeners until our next episode talk to you soon take care and uh be well